Amen, church. If you are visiting with us today, you've come right in the middle of an exciting Bible study series on the book of Judges. And today we're going to be tackling chapter 17 and chapter 18. And I must uh, confess right here, when I first read these two chapters, they, they left me a little bit mystified. I said, why, why these two chapters stuck there? And, uh, you know, after about three days of study, it finally came to me. Amen. So I'll be trying to share a little bit about that with you. The title of our lesson today is Have It Your Way Religion. Now, at this particular time, you should be handed out a map. And we only have enough maps for uh, one for each uh, two people. So you'll have to share the maps today. But I think that they'll be helpful to us as we try to break down these scriptures. Now, as we talked about before, many of the Hebrew writings are not chronological. And in fact, this one is certainly true. We find, in fact, the first 16 chapters are essentially chronological, though sometimes parallel. But chapters 17 through 21 actually take place at the very beginning of the book of Judges, right after Joshua and the elders die. Let's see if we can get some insights into this by going to Judges chapter 20. Beginning in verse 26. We've got a lot of territory to cover today, so buckle up, and here we go. Chapter 20. We're just trying to get us a time marker right here. In verse 26. Then the Israelites, all the people, went up to Bethel. And there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening, presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord, in those days, the Ark of the Covenant of God was there, with Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministering before it. They asked, shall we go up to battle with Benjamin, our brothers, or not? Well, right here we find that Phinehas is the high priest. And, of course, this is the same Phinehas as Numbers chapter 25, the one that had the heart and the zeal for God, where he took out the Midianite couple. Amen. So he was alive during the time of Moses. So we find this has to be at the beginning of the time of the judges. Second important thing to note right here is that the ark has now been moved to Bethel. Now take out your map if you would please. Bethel is located just north of Jerusalem on the line between Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, and the tribe of Ephraim. That's about 12 miles right there. So that's where Bethel is at, and that's a very important marker. Now, in order to get a full understanding of why chapters 17 and 18 of Judges are so important for us to understand, we need to remember our biblical history. We understand Joshua takes the promised land. Amen, guys? Amen. Then comes the time of the Judges, where the Bible says, In those days Israel had no king, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. After the time of the judges, the last judge is Samuel. He anoints Saul king, then David becomes king, then Solomon becomes king, and then the kingdom splits. It becomes Judah and Israel. Judah is led by the rightful heir, the son of Solomon, Rehoboam. Israel is led by the usurper, Jeroboam. Now, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 12 and try to get this all put together. We find that at this point, Jeroboam is reigning in Judah. Jeroboam is reigning in Israel. Now, we're going to begin in verse 25, but take out your maps. Judah is essentially what is Judah right there, kind of in the purple, as well as Benjamin. All the other tribes become what's known as Israel. And that's the division of the kingdom. Jeroboam is reigning with Benjamin and Judah. And all the other tribes are under Jeroboam. And we read this in verse 25. Then Jeroboam fortified Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. For there he went out and built up Peniel. Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. 
After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set in Bethel, there you go, and the other in Dan. And this thing became sin. And the people went even as far as Dan to worship the one there. So right here you see King Jeroboam wants to keep the people of Israel from worshiping in Jerusalem the one true place to worship the one true God. That's where the temple of God had been built. Amen? And so on your map now, you know where Bethel is at. It's now at the southern tip of what becomes the new Israel, the line between Benjamin and Ephraim. Now Dan, and this is where the story of chapter 17 and 18 come from, Dan is located at the very top of your page, right across from Damascus, right at the very top of Naphtali and East Manasseh. And so Jeroboam puts two golden calves to be worshipped, one in Dan and one there in Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. And this way, he prostituted Israel to not go down all the way to Jerusalem. In other words, he wanted to make their, Christ, their religion comfortable. And so he gave them options as far as the truth. Amen? And so today we're going to find how Dan becomes the city of Dan when the Danites are right down there by Judah and Benjamin. Now, let's go to the book of Judges. Amen, guys? Chapter 17. I have three questions today. The first one is, are you pacified or passionate about your religion? Verse 1. Now a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his mother, The 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which you, I heard you utter a curse, I have that silver with me. I took it. Then his mother said, The Lord bless you, my son. I mean, I mean, already we're seeing how far Israel's gotten out there. We find that Micah, who we're finding out already has a kid of his own, is stealing money from his mom. And the Bible says right here that when she utters a curse, he says, well, I don't want to have that curse on me. Here's your money back, mom. And then she goes, oh, you're blessed. So we have the mom now uttering curses and blessings with the same tongue. Amen. Verse 3, when he returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, she says, I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a cast idol. I'll give it back to you. So he turned the silver to his mother, and she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the silversmith who made them into an image and the idol. And they are put in Micah's house. Now this man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and some idols and installed one of his sons as priest. In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Now, right here, Micah totally espouses that verse right here. He's stealing from his mom. The mom is uttering curses and blessings. They're making idols of which to worship. They're making an ephod, and that's just the priestly garment that you come before God to find out what is the will of God. And the Bible says right here, amazingly, he installs one of his sons as priest. And you know his son's not a Levite or anything. He says, okay, son, you're going to be the priest. You're going to be the one who we're going to go to to find out the will of God. Now, in most families, and certainly in families back then, the father is the one that always tells the son what to do. That's the way it's supposed to be anyway. Anyway, right, guys? And so it's, it's so backwards right here. The father says, okay, you're going to be the priest. And, of course, the whole idea is, He tells the son what to do, and this way he can determine what, quote, God's will is for his own life. It's, as we talked about, have it your way religion. Are you with me right here? You see, Israel was just totally disintegrating. Remember, this is at the beginning of the book of Judges, most likely before the reign of Orthanel. It's disintegrating morally. It's disintegrating domestically. It's disintegrating politically. And because of all of those things, it's disintegrating spiritually. Are you with me right here? Okay, now let's keep going. Verse 7. A young Levite from Bethlehem and Judah, who had been living within the clan of Judah, left the town in search of some other place to stay. On his way, he came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim. Well, let's just stop right there. I was mystified. A young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah. And I go, well, that doesn't make sense. Bethlehem is not one of the cities that Levites live in. But that's the point. 
This Levite, the Bible says right here, was wandering. He had no direction. He had no vision. He wasn't even where he's supposed to be. Secondly, you ask, well, why isn't his name given? His name isn't given, not because he's not important, just the opposite. Because he is so important. There is such shame attached that the writer at this particular point says, a young Levite. And that will be revealed to us at the end of the lesson. Amen, guys? And so we find right here that not only is he wandering up from Bethlehem, he goes all the way to the hill country of Ephraim. He's a Levite. He's supposed to be telling the people of God where to go, and yet he himself has no direction. Are you with me right here? Verse 9. Micah asked him, Where are you from? Uh, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah. He said, And I'm looking for a place to stay. Then Micah said to him, Live with me and be my father and my priest, and I'll give you ten shekels of silver a year, your clothes and your food. So Levite agreed to live with him, and the young man was to him like one of his sons. Then Micah installed the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in his house. And Micah said, Now I know the Lord will be good to me, since this Levite has become my priest. Well, it's kind of interesting right here. We see that Micah, in and of himself, has, has, a, has a heart. He says, you know, I really need a spiritual mentor. I really need a spiritual father. He says, and, and since you're a Levite, how about you come and do that? And you know, really, that's, that's something special. And we all kind of sense that we need someone to help us spiritually, don't we? And that's how bad these times were. He finds this wandering Levite who has no direction. He says, hey, how about you be my spiritual father? And the Bible goes on to say, so the Levite agrees to live with him, and the young man was to him like one of his sons. Well, now that's in some ways a, an awesome relationship. You know, we're really blessed today to have uh, Tessany Untalon with us. Yeah. She's just visiting for the, the weekend, and hopefully she'll be coming back down next year to go to school down here in L.A. Amen, guys? Yeah. But she lives up in Portland. Of course, her big sister, Colleen, is teaching in Kids' Kingdom. And both Colleen and Tessany are, are, are very special to Elena and myself. Uh, we're best friends with uh, their dad and mom, Tony and Therese. And we agreed, uh, after being in Portland just about a year, Tony and Therese said, you know, if something would ever happen to us, would you take Colleen and Tessney to be your daughters? And we said, absolutely. And that's the way it needs to be in the kingdom. We need to be family. Are you with me right here? And of course, as family, we like to tease each other a little bit. And so I was with uh, Tessany the other day, trying to take her out to Claremont Colleges and everything. And, and she remembered a, an incident that happened with Eric one time. And she was talking to Eric. She was kind of making fun of herself. And so I don't feel bad telling this little thing on Tessany. But uh, she, she was going up to Eric. She says, hey, Eric, what race, what ethnicity is, is your dad? Eric goes, well, he's Caucasian. She goes, oh, man, I always thought he was white. <laughs> Isn't it great to be family that we can kid each other a little bit like that? Amen. Let's get back to our text right here, okay? You see, Micah knew the Bible or he wouldn't have known that he needed a Levite to be his priest. But sadly, he chose this young Levite and he made him into a son so he could tell his son what to do and what to say. And so therefore, there would be no spiritual influence or direction given to his life. Are you with me right here? And yet at the same time, I think that we need to realize that, hey, there was an emptiness that he felt. I don't know about all of you guys, but when I saw that uh, Owen Wilson had tried to commit suicide this past week, you go, Wow. I mean, here's a guy that starred in many movies. I don't know all of his movies. Uh, the one I kind of liked was Zoolander, but we won't go there. Uh, but here's, I mean, this guy, I mean, he was funny. He's handsome. He's dynamic. He's an actor. He's a multimillionaire. He, quote, in our eyes, has it all. Yet there's an emptiness, so much so, that he tries to commit suicide. Let's face it, no matter how much you have together in the eyes world, there's always that emptiness. You know what I'm talking about? That we all have. You know, there's the story of a, a young girl that uh, came to America when she was four years old. 
And uh, as she grew up, she seemed to have it all together. Uh, she was treasurer of her senior class, cheerleader, homecoming queen, tennis star. And in the midst of all of these things, in her senior year, she found herself totally empty. She was dating at that time, president of the student body. Well, that summer, she studied the Bible, and she was baptized. And today, Elena turns 52 years old. She has been a disciple. She's been a disciple for 34 years. 34 years. But she understood at a young age, you can seemingly have it all, but there's that emptiness inside that only God will fully satisfy. Are you with me right here? And so right here, you have to ask yourself, in your relationship with God, are you pacified like Micah? Or are you passionate like Elena, totally sold out to do the will of God? Let's continue on. Chapter 18. Our second question. Hired away or fired up all day? Verse 1, chapter 18. In those days, Israel had no king. Well, we just read that. I mean, it seems like the writer wants us to get that down. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. It was kind of have it your way religion. Are you with me that year? I mean, it was kind of this fast food mentality. I want to satisfy my needs the quickest way possible. I mean, that's why we got so many fast food places today. Don't you agree? I mean, you got McDonald's. I'm loving it. Now, let's think about what you're loving. You're loving these greasy hamburgers that are, that are clogging up your arteries and going to take you out someday. But you're loving it because of the short-term value. That's how a lot of people look at their faith. You know, you look at the advertisements by Carl Jr., and there's a, there's a seductiveness there. I mean, they have these people eating these giant hamburgers and the ketchup falls and in certain places. And, or they're doing this advertisement now about having flat buns. And the idea, the idea behind it is, hey, eat Carl's Jr. and you will be sexy. Absolutely not. <laughs> and that's what a lot of people use their religion for. They go, you know something, it's time for me to get married. I better go to church and find myself a wife or find myself a husband. Now let me tell you something, that's the best place to find someone to marry. Are you with me right here? But that's not why you go to church. You know, then there's Taco Bell religion. Taco Bell religion. It's got a little spice to it. A little spice. That's, that's, that's for people that are kind of looking for a spicy church that's got great entertainment, great singing. And they can come and watch the performance and then leave and go back and do their life. And, of course, there's the ultimate Burger King religion. Just have it your way. If you don't want the tomatoes, don't have, Don't want the onions, don't. If you don't want the lettuce... Just have it your way. <laughs> and that's why it was so sad. There was no king in Israel. Because God makes his word very clear. Amen. Our second question. Hired away or fired up all day. Chapter 18, verse 1. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites were seeking a place of their own where they might settle. Because they had not yet come into an inheritance amongst the tribe of Israel. So the Danites sent five warriors from Zorah and Estol to spy out the land and explore it. These men represented all the clans, and they told them, go and explore the land. Okay, now we remember Zorah, don't we, church? Oh, church, that was last week with Samson. He was from Zorah, the hornet. Amen? Okay. Amen. <laughs> and so we, we have this, this five-man spying out party. Sent out from Dan. Okay, get your maps out. You see Zora right here on the line between Judah and Dan. That's where these guys are from. And so they're told to go on out, and we read on in verse 2. The men entered the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah where they spent the night. When they were near Micah's house, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. So they turned in there and asked him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? 
Why are you here? Wow. They recognize their voice. There are two schools of thought right here. One goes back to our lesson about Jephthah. About the Ephraimites. You remember the Shibbeth and the Sibbeth? That the Ephraimites had a certain dialect. And some people think, well, they recognize his voice in the sense of, oh, this guy's not from here. But most likely, it is exactly what it says. They recognized his voice. This was a voice that all of Israel knew. And the Bible says, they asked him, who brought you here? Why are you here at Micah's house in the middle of Ephraim? What are you doing in this place? Why are you here? Well, you know, the the sad thing is, here is this Levite who seems to have some renown, who now has been adopted by Micah. But we have to understand he had nothing. And so now we see another level of degradation in Israel. Whenever a group of people lose spiritual confidence, the first place that it shows is in their financial giving. And this place, the people of God were no longer supporting the Levites. And so they were wandering around aimlessly. And so in verse 4, he told them what Micah had done for him and he said, He has hired me and I am his priest. Then he said to him, please inquire of God to learn whether our journey will be successful. The priest answered him, go in peace. Your journey has the Lord's approval. So the five men left and came to Laish, where they saw that the people were living in safety, like the Sidonians, unsuspecting and secure. And since they lacked nothing, they were prosperous. Also, they lived a long way from the Sidonians and had no relationship with anyone else. Okay, get your maps out again. Laish is at the very top of Natali and East Manasseh. That's where Laish is at. Now you got to start thinking right here. What the heck are the Danites doing there? I know that crushed your mind. <laughs> because you see, right here you find all the tribal inheritances. You see what I'm talking about? But these tribal inheritances weren't random things done by men. These were the assignment by lot by God. So we actually find the record of this occasion in the book of Joshua. Let's go to the book of Joshua quickly. Come on, yeah. It's a sad little footnote. Joshua chapter 19, verse 47. But the Danites had difficulty to take possession of their territory. So they went up and attacked Leshem, took it, put it to the sword, and occupied it. They settled in Leshem and named it Dan after their forefathers. Well, Leshem and Laish are the same place. There's a little bit of different Hebrew vowels right there. And so we find right here the issue. The Danites did not have the faith to take the promised land that they were supposed to. And so they start wandering out on their own. Look how far they got off track. Look how far... Laish is from Dan. Is that incredible? That's how far they got off track. That's how far they got faked out. You know, it's so easy to get deceived. It's so easy to get deceived. I have to come clean about something here. I've had to work more carefully, particularly on Sunday mornings, combing my hair. Because there's a little bit more that's been creeping on in right here. And you know, I was deceived because I thought that I was hiding it from everybody. And so I got in the shower last night, and I looked at the shampoo, and it said, shampoo for extra thin hair. And I go, that's not my shampoo. But I I squeeze it on, use it, you know. I said, Elena probably got it by accident. And so I got out of the shower. She goes, well, how'd you like your new shampoo? (laughs) You know, 
It's funny. We can fake ourselves out. We think we're faking everybody else out. And it's a total lie. But Lena can see that it's getting less up there. You know what I'm talking about? Well, right here, the Danites were faking themselves out. The Danites going, well, it's just a little distance over here. <laughs> as far as the promised land is concerned. But bottom line, these people would offer no resistance. And that's what takes us all out, is we want to go the path of least resistance. Are you with me here, church? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 8. When they returned to Zorah and Estral, their brothers asked them, How'd you find things? They answered, Come on, let's attack them. We have seen that the land is very good. Aren't you going to do something? Don't hesitate to go there and take it over. When you get there, you'll find an unsuspecting people and a spacious land that God has put into your hands, a land that lacks nothing whatsoever. Then 600 men from the clan of the Danites, armed for battle, set out from Zor and Esterol. On their way, they set up camp near Kerioth Jerem in Judah. This is why that place west of Kerioth Jerem is called Manan Dan to this day. That means Camp Dan. From there, they went on the hill country of Ephraim and came to Micah's house. So here they go. They're going up from Dan and they're going into Ephraim. And we're reading verse 14. Then the five men who spy out the land of Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that the one of these houses has an ephod, other household gods, a carved image, and a cast idol? Now you know what to do. So they turned in there and went to the house of the young Levite at Micah's place and greeted them. The 600 Danites armed for battle stood at the entrance to the gate. The five men who had spied out the land went inside and took the carved image, the ephod, the other household gods, and the cast idol while the priest and the 600 armed men stood at the entrance to the gate. When these men went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod and the other household gods and the cast idol, the priest said to them, What are you doing? I mean, this young Levite gets ticked off. What the heck are you doing? Taking the idol, the ephod. Verse 19. They answered him, Be quiet. Don't say a word. Come with us and be our father and priest. Isn't it better that you serve a tribe and a clan in Israel as priests rather than just one man's household? Then the priest was glad. He goes, yeah, more money, more people, more prestige. Yeah, let's take the idol. Let's take the ephod. I'm ready to go. See, he was hired away. He took the ephod and the other household gods, the carved image, and went along with the people, putting their little children... Their livestock and their possessions in front of them, they turned away and left. When they had gone some distance from Micah's house, the men that lived near Micah were called together and overtook the Danites. As they shouted after them, the Danites turned and said to Micah, What's the matter with you that you called out your men to fight? He replied, You took the gods I made and my priest and went away. What else do I have? How can you ask, What's the matter with you? The Danites answered, Don't argue with us. Or some hot-tempered men will attack you. And you and your family will lose your lives. So the Danites went away. And Micah, seeing that they were too strong for him, turned around and went back home. He goes, man, I don't want to die for these gods. I don't want to die. Wow. It's kind of interesting. He chases after the Danites to save his gods. I thought it was supposed to be the other way around. I thought it was God that was supposed to come and save us. Secondly, he sees that this kind of religion is just not something worth dying for. You know, it, it, it's amazing to me that Americans look at the Muslims, the radical Muslims, and we're just taking it back to, oh man, those people, they're, 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 they're radical, I don't understand them. They're willing to die for their God. Well, sadly enough, Jesus said, if you're going to be his follower, you've got to be willing to die for Jesus and to die for one another. That's how much we've cheapened religion. See, we have it our own way religion, and we call it Christianity. True Christianity calls for the sacrifice of everything you are, even your life. You know... This was a dark day right here, but there was another dark day that was to come during the time of Jeremiah the prophet. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah. This happens a few hundred years later. And we read in chapter 5 these words. In verse 30. 
A horrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy lies. The priests rule by their own authority. And my people love it this way. Wow, this was happening right here with the Danites and with Micah. This young Levite, the priest, the prophet, he was lying, he was robbing, he was stealing. He was willing just to get hired away to whatever was more prestigious and more valuable monetarily. It's kind of interesting that the people love it this way and then the question comes, but what will you do in the end? Look at chapter 6. From verse 13, from the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophet and priest alike, all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. Sadly, the leaders, it was all about money. You talk about the American dream. That's why Christianity has gotten off track. It's all about the money. And we want to construct a religion. We want to construct a Christian way of life where we can have all the money we can get. And when you have that kind of a church, and when you have that kind of leadership, the Bible says they're not going to really deal with sin. See, the Bible says right here, He says, they dress the mood of my people as though we're not serious, saying, peace, peace, where there is no peace. You know, our good brother, Ron Harding, has gone through a very, very tough time the last several weeks. He's had an unbelievable bout with boils. Now, a lot of people kind of minimize having boils. But remember, Hezekiah almost died because of a boil. And these are the kind of boils that Ron's been having. They're, they're, they're gross. They're ugly. They're huge. <laughs> they're pus-filled. He goes, bro, you got to see this. Rolls it on up. <laughs> Now, what would have happened if I said, oh, Ron, let me get a little Band-Aid for you right here. Mm. (laughs) That one done nothing. On these kind of boils, you have to be radical. You have to take a knife and cut it. You have to squeeze all the gunk out. you got to deal with it. A Band-Aid doesn't get the job done. See, let's face it, guys. Our lives can be full of a bunch of pus. And if someone doesn't get in there with the Word of God and deal with it as a scalpel cleans out an infected wound, there will be no life for the people. Are you with me right here? See, so you you got to get a conviction that being cut by the Word of God is good. Because it's cutting that which can kill you out of your life. So often when we read our Bibles, we get convicted. We go, oh, that's the end of that. We're putting it down. <laughs> or, oh, man, I went to that church and I just... I just felt convicted. I felt cut. Maybe I better find another church where there's a lot more music and and the sermon's a little bit shorter too. (laughs) No, we have to have a conviction to love God, to love the Word of God so much that we don't dress the wound of God's people lightly, saying peace, peace, where there is no peace. Not only from the pulpit, but with each other. The Bible teaches that we need to love one another To help each other deal with the spiritual challenges of our life. Are you with me right here, guys? Let's turn to John chapter 10. In John 10, Jesus Jesus lays it on out. He says in verse 11, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Right here, Jesus talks about true biblical leadership. And he uses himself as an example. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm not like a hireling, like that Levite that just got hired out for money. When the sheep are attacked by a wolf, he says, I am willing to lay down my life. Now, 
Now, it's very interesting what's said a little bit later right here. Look at what's said in verse 19. At these words, the Jews were again divided. Many of them said, he's demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But the others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Right here, when Jesus preached the word, he divided people. You know, there's a thought going on right now that if you're divisive, you must be in sin. Now, divisiveness is a sin if it's dividing people away from God. In other words, the wolf was a sinner that was taking people away from God and scattering the sheep. But Jesus himself came into the Jews, the people of God. He laid out the truth. And the people were divided because truth will always divide. You got to make a decision. You got to make a decision. How radical are you for Jesus Christ? Is your faith worth dying for? You know, a brother that uh, I, I, I've come to love a lot is uh, Danny Ramirez. And uh, Danny just got restored last week. And uh, what, what a heart for God. This man has. He's 27 years old. And I mean, today he's just filled with the aura of God. You know what I'm talking about? And he was telling me his story. He got baptized in 2002 along with his wife. And after a year or so, his wife fell away. And it really hit his heart. And he tried to hang in there, tried to hang in there. But he grew weary. He took his eyes off of Jesus. And he lost heart. And he too fell away. Sadly, there was a child involved. And so he tried to keep up the relationship, but nothing seemed to happen. Well, a few years come, and he meets this young lady, and they start going out. And he starts getting a little bit serious with her. And he goes, you know something, if we're going to get serious, we need to talk about God. She goes, that's awesome. Let's talk about God then. He goes, yeah, I, I... I think you need to start going to church. She needs to start going to church. (laughs) So she was checking out a couple churches. And he goes, you know something? I need to tell you my life. Because I've got to guide you to a church that teaches the right life and doctrine. And so a few weeks ago, he took her to the church here. Well, when Danny heard the word, he was really moved. One of his best friends is Luis Lujac Martinez. And so they start getting together and studying. I was able to jump in at the end of the studies. And and, and we had one of those studies where we just laid it out about what it takes to follow God. And it was great. And and he said, you know, I'm not quite there, but I want to get broken. And then we prayed and he started crying. I called up Danny. The next night, and I said, hey, dude, how are you doing? Are you you wanting to be restored? He goes, oh, yeah, it feels so great to be so clean. He says, you know, and I did the right thing. He says, bro, you know, technically, I was still married. And so I told the girl that I was going out with that we had to cut it. And uh, that I had to do what was right, and I'm going through the process of divorce right now. And if something great happens to us, amen. But I just really encourage her to go find God. And she says, you know, that last Sunday I was there was really great because I, I, got, to, I got to hear that, that woman from the Spanish ministry, Patricia De Leon. And Sonia had asked Patricia when she's come to church, well, how excited are you to study the Bible from a 1 to a 10? She says, I'm a 10. Yeah. And she says, I was inspired because Patricia was a 10. And in one week she studied the Bible and got baptized. And she told Danny, Danny, I'm a 10. I want to get baptized. Well, she's been studying every day. And today, Raffaella is going to be baptized into Christ. Is that awesome, guys? Is that exciting? See, the thing you got to see right here is you, you, you can't be afraid to lay out the word of God. You can't say peace, peace where there is no peace because you don't change people's lives that way. Now Danny's life is being changed. Now he's changing other people's lives. Today Raphael's life will be changed and more and more people will be affected because we are going by the word of God. So that fire you on up. See, you've got to get a conviction. Have you been hired away? 
Are you fired up all day? Our last point. Let's get back to the book of Judges. Come on, Kip. Come on, bro. Come on, Kip. This is the blow away part, guys. Come on, Come on. Remember, Micah just lets the Danites leave. And so we read this in verse 27. Then they took what Micah had made, his priest, and went to Laish against the peaceful and unsuspecting people. They attacked them with the sword and burned down their city. There was no one to rescue them because they lived a long way from Sidon and had no relationship with anyone else. The city was in a valley near Beth Rehob. Wow. Our third question is, Isolated or consolidated? See, right here, the Israelites picked on Laish because he was in the middle of nowhere. They felt secure. Now, it was a false sense of security, wasn't it? They were totally isolated. And there was no one to rescue them. And so the Danites travel up all the way through the Promised Land to find this isolated city... And they get it. Laish falls and they rename it Dan. Now here's what happens. The Danites rebuilt the city and settled there. They named it Dan after their forefather Dan, who was born to Israel. Though the city used to be called Laish. There the Danites set up for themselves the idols. And Jonathan, son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan. Until the time of captivity of the land. They continued to use the idols Micah had made. All the time the house of God was in Shiloh. What happened? Who was the young Levite? It was the grandson of Moses. The grandson of Moses had become a false prophet. The grandson of Moses had departed from the truth and now was preaching the word for whoever would give him the most money. The grandson of Moses was even so corrupted that he stole the gods of the man that he pledged to serve. It shows how quickly And how fast the people of God departed from the ways of God. You know, the interesting thing right here is the record is so detailed about Laish and their isolation because that's what happened to Israel. That's the, the irony of the whole thing. The Danites picked on Laish because it was isolated. But all the way through the time of the judges... All the surrounding people, the Moabites, the Philistines, they pick on each of the Israelite tribes because they're isolated, they're autonomous, they're not consolidated. Are you with me right here? And that was why they could be so easily overcome. Is they weren't consolidated. You remember the old story about the little kid that had a father. And and the father said, hey, try to break this stick. And the kid broke it. He says, now, try to break these six sticks. And the kid couldn't break the six sticks. He says, stick together with your brothers. See, there's strength in consolidation and in numbers. Are you with me right here? Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews 10, we're taught about what it means to be consolidated. In verse 23 it says, Let us hold on swerving to the hope we profess, for he who promises is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. He said there's a lot of people that have gotten in the habit of missing church. And the point of church is not just so you can become strong, but the other point of church is so you can become to the church and strengthen other people. Are you with me right here, guys? You know, here in the congregation, we lay it out about the commitment. We're together Sunday morning. Amen? Amen. 
Amen. We're together for the midweek. Amen? Amen. We expect every single disciple to be involved in a small group, a Bible talk. And we expect every single person to have a discipleship partner. That's just laying out the commitment right there. Now, that, that, that's to protect you. It's not to make your life uncomfortable or hard. Instead of isolation where you can be gotten, it's consolidation. Are you with me right here? Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Come on, bro. In Hebrews 3, we read in verse 12. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Well, wow. the Bible says right here, we're commanded, we need daily contact with other disciples. It's not a matter of just stopping in the church or making all the means about it. We need to be actively involved in each other's lives. We are to be family. Amen, church? I want to ask you, is that the way you live your life? Or are you too busy to obey this command? If you are too busy to obey this command, you know something? You're right. You are too busy and you need to repent. You need to make the changes in your life so that you prioritize God and His kingdom. Are you with me? Yes. Otherwise, Satan will isolate you and he'll get you. He'll get you. You know, it's uh, awesome having uh, Eric with us here. And so I was thinking... Well, what, what, what story about Eric's life could I embarrass him with? <laughs> and so, one of my favorites is, goes back all the way to 1989. And I think that uh, Kathy was uh, not, not quite with us then yet. But back in 1989, Eric was five years old and cute at that particular time. <laughs> And we had gone as a family to lead the church planting in Bangkok, Thailand. And so, you know, we'd gone there. We'd been working hard, inviting a lot of people out, and people become disciples. That was awesome. But, you know, sometimes you need to have a little fun, like our beach party tomorrow morning. Amen? Yeah. So we said, okay, well, what's, what's, what's fun to, to go do here in Bangkok? And we, so we heard about the Red Cross Snake Farm. And I go, that sounds awesome. The Red Cross Snake Farm. And you say, well, why do they need a Red Cross Snake Farm? Because out in the fields, there are so many poisonous snakes in Thailand. And so they have the snake farm, and they milk the snakes to be able to get the venom so they can produce the anti-venom for the villagers. But it's pretty cool because you go in there and you see all these live snakes. And then it said, hey, there's a snake show. And and all of us, except for Elena, go, this is awesome. (laughs) And this is, I mean, guys, this is third world. And so a snake show wasn't behind glass. <laughs> you, are, you are right there. And they bring the poison snakes. They put them right down in front of you. And then, you know, they kind of tease the snakes a little bit and all this. And they jump like this. And let me tell you something. You don't want to be isolated. Everybody's huddling together, you know. <laughs> and so they bring them on. They, they bring in these Siamese cobras. Then they brought in the king cobra. Twelve feet long. No joke. And they set down the cotton-picking king cobra right there. Everybody's going, whoa. (laughs) Then right at the end of the snake show, the the, the guy kind of builds it up. He goes, and now we're going to be bringing in perhaps the world's most poisonous snakes. Everybody's getting a little closer. (laughs) Now in the back... There was a, there's this Japanese guy. And, you know, we admire the Japanese people for their cool and calm under pressure, don't we? <laughs> well, he was standing in the back. Let us just say he was alone. And the announcer goes, we're bringing in perhaps the world's most poisonous snakes, the banded crates. Turn around. Everybody turns around. Well, this Japanese guy turns around, and the guy had him very purposely right here, about five inches from his face. He looks at him, he goes, no! I mean, this went on. I mean, it's a 30-second, oh, like this, you know. It's like this totally freaked out. He walks back and forth like this, you know, and he goes like this, and, and, and then he just walks away. And all of us, we just laughed at him. 
Look at that guy. He was isolated and they picked on him. How silly to be isolated. So we all go, okay, well now it's, the snake show's over. Let's go see the snakes. So, you know, it's, it's, did I mention to you it's third world? Yeah. yeah, it's third world. And so you see some of these snakes in these aquariums. There's glass on the front, glass on the side, but only screen in the back. And so I'm going around, and I thought I had the boys with me. And I'm looking at this one tree. I go, there must not, must not be any snakes in here. I don't see any snakes. And it's Sean and Eric looking. And all of a sudden, I didn't notice. Then I saw Eric go around the back. And all of a sudden, on the tree, there's a whole bunch of movement. The snakes were so perfectly camouflaged. They looked exactly like the tree. But there were about 15 of these poison snakes. And here's Eric at the back of it, five years old, puts his hands on the screen so he could see. I come around there faster than I've ever moved in my life. And I just grab and say, son, what are you doing? He goes, dad, you're so mean. You're so mean. And he starts crying. I said, I said, son, son, those are snakes. Look at the snakes. Oh, dad, you saved my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You see, when you go off by yourself, are you with me right here? And you get isolated. Even though you see the Japanese guy get isolated on up, that's when Satan can get you. See, we need to understand that as disciples, we cannot be isolated from God. But we've got to be consolidated with God and all of those other disciples that are sold out. Are you with me right here? And so, we look at our generation today. We look at disciples that are doing what's right in their own eyes, just like the time of the judges. They're in churches that are doing what's right in their own eyes. That's why there's autonomy. We need to understand that the only way to forcefully advance the kingdom around the world in this generation is to be bonded with like-minded disciples who share a vision to evangelize the world. And yes, there's a sacrifice for not doing it your way. But it's worth it because the world can be evangelized. You know, it's a sad chapter in the history of Israel, Micah and Jonathan. And yet it's there in the Bible so that we don't repeat it. Today, let's determine to do it God's way and not have it do it your way religion. Let's do it God's way religion. No matter what the price, thanks and God bless.